Welcome back to episode 155 of the Disorganized Wizard Club podcast. My name is Alex. I'm joined as always by Adam Hello. and Cam. Hey. And we're a group of Ottawa-based players that play just about anything and everything we can qualify for. We talk about decks, tournament stories, just about anything to help you and ourselves get better at magic. Most deaf. I was kind of hoping that you wouldn't introduce us as like Alex, Adam, and Cam, but that you would do the intro with, I'm a 3-3 elk. With me as always is a 3-3 elk <laughs> and a 3-3 elk. <laughs> <laughs> That would have been oh, okay. really good. We, we blew just it. done that next week. Oh, yeah. Blew it. Oh, well. Can't win them all. <laughs> yeah, that would have been nuts. Uh, yeah, we had a podcast planned and lots of topics, but they also just got... Yeah, all we're talking about is elks. They got elked. Yeah. Yeah, it's hunting season after all. <laughs> Get your license. Yeah, I mean, we do have a lot to talk about this week. The Mythic Championship 6 is this weekend. We're going to... Uh, where is it? Richmond. For standard and draft. Standard and draft. You know what? I feel this time around, I used to like the later Mythic Championships in the format as things have been more figured out, like what they've been doing with the other paper championships this year. This time around, I just don't care. Why is that? Why Why <laughs> do you think you don't care? Uh, formats just... I don't want to be. I don't want to be negative. All right. I don't want to just come on the cast and just feed into this whole negativity that the whole magic community yeah, you has can, become. Just you can just open Twitter for how, that. Yeah. If you want your negativity, just head on over to Magic Twitter, and you, you'll get a crap ton of it. But man, it's bad. All right. Let's be optimistic then. I am excited for this weekend because, as you mentioned, there is a draft portion. I know a lot of people <laughs> don't like watching draft, but I'm excited to see how the like you know the pro players approach this draft format because. The bots on Arena have been kind of wonky in the way that they draft it, so I feel like normally I get a good sense of the limited format from just playing a lot on Arena, but I haven't really been getting that, and I feel like the paper drafting experience of Eldraine, which I got to see a bit at GP Montreal and seemed interesting, is, like, different than on Arena, so I'd like to watch, like, I'm excited to watch those portions. I think this draft format's also just great when yeah. you get to play it on, on Moto or paper or anywhere else but Arena, you know? I think it's, uh, the gameplay is is... Really interesting. It's not typical because of the adventure cards and the way they change how you want to interact, how you want board prentices to operate, stuff that you guys talked mm -hmm. about when uh, ABJ was a guest on the podcast and I was off that week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the limited format is really And I like cool. watching drafts normally. Yeah, I do too. I like considering takes. They're fun to watch with people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and sit around and you can all talk about like what you would have taken and yada, yada. It's mm -hmm. a lot of fun. We used to do that way back in the day when we'd stream drafts, remember? Yep. Yeah, that was the best part of it. It was just drafting. Yeah. Gameplay was whatever. We could just blow that. Like. And speaking of talking about gameplay, we are going to be co-streaming the final day of the Mythic Championship this weekend. So head on over to twitch.tv slash disorganized wizard club this Sunday and follow along all the action as we co-stream the event. It's going to be fun. Yeah, we'll do better commentary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it'll be a good time. But uh, so we've got standard this weekend. This past weekend, we had the first two standard GPs of the standard format, believe it or not. And uh, <laughs> there hadn't been GPs yet? Not for not standard. standard. Huh. Yeah, yeah. and they were, uh, they were about what you could expect. First place in both tournaments were food decks, Gilded Goose, Oko, Wicked Wolf. We, in, uh, over in Nagoya, there were seven food decks in the top eight. And a blue white control. And a blue white control. One of the only decks that can uh, that can elk hunt successfully. Actually, yeah, we notably, talked about this. There was another blue white control deck in the top eight of um, Lyon as well, seventh place. So this is two weekends in a row now that blue white control has put up a good result, top eighting both these GPs and a top sixteen the MCQ qualifier weekend as well, which we talked about last week. So is there something here? Yeah. I, I think so. I mean, I've been playing this deck a decent amount. Mm -hmm. I talked about my experiences playing it. Uh, I think it's quite strong. Uh, I think that its problem is its early game consistency is quite low. Mm -hmm. If it can get to the late game, it will usually win. You know, it's the mid game, the bridging the early to the mid game that the deck has a hard time with. It's pretty easy for you to go, okay, I'll, t I'll time wipe this board, and then they play Nissa and you die. Yeah, You know, it's that window that you lose. But if you can weather that storm and survive, you're not losing the late game. So you have a lot of sneaky tools here that actually turn the corner pretty quickly as well for 
for a blue white deck like brazen borrower actually kills people pretty quickly mm-hmm. once you have two of them like you just wait right you use the bounces at some point and then counter something on the way back down is usually what happens like they have an yeah. oko that you got to get rid of and you bounce it with brazen borrower and then you dove and speed it or whatever absorb it on the way back down and then you know either you can kill them with uh finale of glory and teferi and just you know end of turn just make a bunch of guys and kill them or you can just have you know two brazen borrowers on an adventure and just wait for them to return from their adventure and just six them every turn at some point it's pretty easy to put people into a top deck mode because a lot of people's removal they're playing is murderous rider which they're going to use on your teferis and other things like maybe your gadwick even if uh there's a threat that you're going to bounce you know that you're going to bounce your uh gadwick back to your hand a lot of people just kill it because it's going to be too much yeah. So, yeah, no, the deck is like, it's pretty good. It's just the, yeah, like I said, bridging the, because look at, it's an early game. What does it have? If you're on the draw, this is a play draw dependent deck. If you win the die roll every game, like your chance to win goes way up. But if you're on the draw, look at this deck list. What are you doing on yeah. the draw? Yeah, it's hard times. You have... They just resolve everything and kill you. Yeah. Four tw- Tranquil Clove in the mana base too. That's awkward. Uh, that Those are actually fine. Those those never really like come back to get you. Actually, you just turn one of them and then turn three or uh, turn four of them a lot of the times. Yeah, like there's like a lot of safe turns. It's never an issue because okay. you play 27 lands, right? That's a lot of lands. I think this guy's playing 27, 15, 19, 22. Yeah, this guy's playing 27. Yeah. So it's pretty common that most people play 27. Um, you're and all your other lands come into play untapped, right? Yeah. Like Castle Vantress and everything. I like the change. This person switched. So originally when this list was popular, people played three Castle uh, Vantress, the blue one, mm-hmm. which was a change I immediately made after trying these decks out because it's not that good, whereas the white one is actually incredible uh, in this deck. It also gives you a way to win, pressure Planeswalkers, block in desperate situations, you know, lock up a creature on the ground permanently. Like trading your land and four mana for locking a creature up every turn is it's just an easy, yeah, you know. It's pretty much a maze of it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um so. Oh, I really wonder how popular this deck's going to be now because, I mean, top eighting both GPs. both GPs and the MCQ Weekend is no, like, small feat. Yeah. Clearly something's here, and it can keep pace with all of these Oko decks. Oh, yeah, it definitely so. can. Yeah, yeah, it definitely can. It, uh, there's some matchups that can be pretty tough, though, for it, uh, depending on how they play out. It's interesting. I think it's, like, one of the fair, fairer decks in the format that has a fair shot against Oko. So you don't necessarily care. I mean... I say that, but like I said, if you're on the draw and they have a turn two Oko off a of goose, you, you know, they just sit behind it until you answer everything, and then they're just gonna, mm-hmm. they're just gonna miss you and kill you. So, and Wicked Wolf is also a problem, right? Because sometimes you have to prison realm it because it won't die to a wrath because it has food lurk sitting around. So I don't know. There are still obviously holes in the deck. For me, the blue white deck. For anyone interested in playing it, is like a lot about the die roll. Um, and then if you lose the die roll, you have to just try and use your life total uh, as a resource as much as you possibly can in order to stop the major threats from coming down, you know, like to counter, because it's about timing your counter spells and your counter magic. I'm curious if this blue white deck um, is sort of in its final form so long as Oko is around and like this food deck stay the same, or if it starts to get tuned now, if this kind of these two finishes that these GPs sort of let people know that it is viable. It sort of has proved itself twice now in two weekends. And there's probably a lot of, you know, people who consider themselves control players who haven't really been able to register counter spells in a while that might pick this up now. Yeah, I think that's definitely going to happen. Yeah, another, the deck that ended up winning uh, Grand Prix Lyon is uh, this Bant Ramp deck. It says Bant Food, but playing the three mass manipulation, another copy of this deck also finished in third place. So, you know, this deck opting to go much bigger game one instead of playing noxious grass and going towards salt eye you're just playing i guess a bigger ramp strategy and yeah. going over the top of your opponents both these decks playing aether gust in the main deck too what do you how do you feel about this deck in the the field it makes sense like once you realize that the entire field is just nissa and oko and big crises then mass manipulation becomes a lot more enticing game one and then maybe game two, you don't want it as much. I'm curious how they board because if everyone's bringing in Veil of Summer's mass manipulation, looks pretty bad. Yeah. Um, 
but you know you can time it or you can just have a Teferi in play or something like if mm-hmm. I like it as a game one plan yeah, yeah. that's what I mean like yeah. it just game one probably beats the mirror you know like it makes the mirror less skill intensive in the sense where you know if you just survive long enough you will win the late game just due to the power level this is just classic like uh mid-range arms racing right yeah it's kind of the next step you know a lot of people went towards salt eye playing noxious grasp in the main deck and this just kind of doesn't really care about that game plan yeah it's just an arms race right yeah. it's like uh do you remember when teamer energy was like the biggest deck yep and then people started playing bolus like the planeswalker bolus that was hype and yeah. started just getting bigger and bigger and adding gear hulks and then that became the deck like yeah, yeah, the power level was so scare up god started to make an yep. appearance too yeah yeah yeah. it's yeah. just a arms race for just more and more powerful effects that you can squeeze into a deck but the thing is we just don't have many the thing with the food deck is like i'm curious if a set could even warp this at this point you know and make this a deck that doesn't dominate the format anymore yeah i don't i don't really know because we're because i honestly didn't think i was wrong like i think we all were about the because we thought and it kind of was until they banned field of the dead but i would have thought teferi 3 was just still more impactful than it is yeah, and it's not like it's right now, falling off a lot from what I expected. Yeah, yeah, it's still around for sure. Which is, we also did kind of say there is a chance that because the mana doesn't line up as well, true in the format that Teferi three takes a dive. Which so I guess we were both wrong and right in that regard. But yeah, I mean, I don't know what's going to change that Oko and Crisis are not, you know, because they're in every one of these decks, right? Whether they're yeah. Bant food, whether they're Bant ramp, Simic, like it doesn't matter. It's all just Oko and Crisis, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, another deck that did well this weekend, which also top 16 the MCQ weekend, is this Black Red Sacrifice deck. Just got to hit him with the told you so. <laughs> yeah, and also in this top eight was another four-color Sacrifice deck, which I've seen featuring, this deck a lot. Yeah. You know, Corvold, which, yeah, I've seen this deck floating around Arena as well, people trying this out. We talked about this last week, right, about how I thought this deck was yeah. actually good. Yeah. Two copies in the top eight. At what point do we say that this deck is good? I think it is good. Mayhem Devil does a lot. Um, I think it's good. Mm -hmm. As you were mentioning, a lot of the format is like huge crisis or like big voracious hydras or just, you know, these things sitting around that uh, I'm not sure if the four-color version is playing it, but the red blacklist features claim the firstborn. You just take those and sack it. It's like a removal spell that hits all the best creatures in the format. Mm -hmm. Uh, This deck's strong. Just Mayhem Deviling people is sweet. Well, also... Like, if you have a Cauldron Familiar and a Witch's Oven, how do, like, how do you lose to Wicked Wolves? You don't really. You can't. You can't just lose to creatures on the ground. Yeah. They have no reach. They're, you're kind of forcing your opponent to deal with the Witch's Oven or else you're just going to lock up the ground. Yeah, which is, you're also fine if your Witch's Oven gets 3-3'd, three, mm-hmm. which is what they're going to have to do. So, Because mm-hmm. you have a bunch in your deck. Uh, this one only playing three, but also playing Trail of Crumbs, which is... Well, awesome. Yeah. But I've played against, yeah, a lot of these, and you can't really win on the ground, and you win by a huge crisis. And if you don't time your crisis is right, you're going to lose. Uh, the sacrifice tag, I talked about this last week on the podcast that I, I said, I, I think this deck is very real. I think it's very good. Just the, you know, Midnight Reaper plus Witches Oven alone is like pretty nuts. Yeah, it's enough cards like you can usually keep up with the crisis if you have that assembled for a turn or two. Yeah, or just Cauldron Familiar, Witches Oven, Midnight Reaper all on the board. I get to drain you and draw a card every turn. And I guess it's sort of because there's so much food around, this is maybe not that uh, often to come up, but I feel like these sacrifice decks have an incredible blue-white matchup. Like, what what's blue-white control supposed to do against Witches Oven loops? Actually, I smashed them. Really? Yeah. How do you, like? Don't they just keep catting you to death? Uh, well, you just start bound. You just bounce things with Teferi three over and over. And, I guess like, they just the run out of resources, and like one good time wipe or like counter magic is really bad for them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would just imagine that like if they ever assembled an oven, that like you could just never deal with the cat, and you'd take one to two per turn and die. Yeah, but you have all those like you have absorbs and um, the tranquil coves that you just incidentally end up gaining life, and then eventually. Your, um, your clock's faster than theirs. Your Castle Arden and Arvindale yeah. and everything can just block everything they're doing on the ground and you just kill them with like Brazen Borrowers. Yeah. It's weird. You actually just tempo them out. Those six beats you were talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, you just sort of tempo them out. Like it's really weird. I, I, I will tell you, 
that Blue White has the best Phoenix matchup in standard ever because I noticed that deck's been seeing a resurgence, and I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing more of it too. Really? Blue Red Phoenix? Yeah. Like Improbable Alliance Blue Red? Mm. It's actually kind of interesting how people have been playing it. I've seen lots of different versions of ways people have been putting Phoenix, but a lot of it's just Thrill of Possibility, Royal Scions, Improbable, and Phoenixes. Uh, Royal Scions is just bonkers in that deck. Like yeah, absolutely full-blown bonkers in that deck. But uh, let me tell you, when you Dovin's Veto a Thrill of Possibility, it feels so cool. good. So in a field of everyone trying to go over the top of each other in these food mirrors, the deck that ended up winning... Uh, GP Nagoya was just straight blue green food. Pretty straightforward deck list. You got the four brazen borrowers. You have three Aether Gust in the main deck. Also two Mobilized District. So in the mana base. Yeah, the Mobilized District you love to see. I think that's awesome. This is actually almost identical to what the second place list that the DWC organizational played because mm -hmm. they were even playing the brazen borrowers. Super, yeah. so, super close. There's like a few cards off. Can Brazen Borrower pick up your stuff? No, like it's only opponents. Oh, opponents. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is, this is interesting, right? Because everyone's just kind of assume, naturally moved towards Salt Eye so you can have the Noxious Crest to get a leg up in the mirror or you're going towards Bant and trying to go bigger with mass manipulation. And then this just straight blue-green deck just comes out here and runs the tables. Do we even have to dilute our deck and play a worse mana base? Or can we just still play blue green? I mean, right? I, don't, I don't know. I feel like it's probably close, like too close to really tell and just do whatever you feel. But I feel like this might have been a pretty lucky run. I don't know. I'm like not convinced that this version's better. Like it just doesn't no seem as powerful. And like I'm hesitant to say winning like a match means it's better, you know? Like, yeah, I don't know. You can get lucky. Like, I don't want to be too results oriented, but I will say that Brazen Borrower is like a way, way, way better card than I thought it was when I originally saw it. Like, I thought it'd be playable. I like knew it would see play, but man, it is like nice. Yeah, maybe <laughs> just the extra clock you get from having borrowers in the air, like having the additional flyers. Right, like, because like all the decks attack on the ground. Yeah, and like every other deck trying to go to three colors, like, is going to shock itself more. Like, maybe you don't have to actually push that much more in the air. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, that thing hits hard. And if you just, like, keep Krasis off the board, that, that thing will kill you. There's nothing else in the food decks that really stop it. They don't want to waste their turn 3 3 a, a Borrower. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Brazen Borrower is pretty good. But yeah, rounding out the big standard events this past weekend, Salt Eye Midrange ended up taking down the Moto PTQ as well. So, Elko is champ, champ everywhere. He also, Elko had a good showing at the Eternal weekend, too. Did you hear about that? Yeah. Yeah, taking down every single format. Yeah, won every format. Yeah. In the last couple of weeks. It's also been winning all the memes. I think, <laughs> I, yeah. So I think I'm going to say it now. And you, asked, you asked Alex a yeah. few weeks ago, is it better? Is it the best Planeswalker ever printed? I ain't have to say, yeah. I'm firmly in the camp. It's the best Planeswalker ever printed. Yeah. Well, yeah. If you're just going by dominance across multiple formats. Well, what, what else would? Nothing else has ever done this, right? No. Yeah. God, no. Not to this extent. This is absurd. Yeah, unless I'm just like misremembering JTMS's time in the sun, but I don't think I am. Like, so Jace was before I started playing Magic. I started playing after it had rotated out of standard, so I wasn't playing during that time. But I just don't remember in Legacy and Vintage how dominant it was. That's the only thing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Ever since I started playing, though, like that card's obviously very good, and I know it was extremely powerful in standard, but I really don't think it was ever at this level from everything Well, it was I've also paired in. with, like, Stoneforge and a Batter Skull. Yeah, I mean. And, like, Ponder was legal, mm -hmm. I believe, in that as well. Yeah. Didn't it have a 32-copy top 8 of some GP? Yeah. Which Oko hasn't quite I think done it had yet. a few. Actually, yeah. 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 It might still be the most dominant standard. Like, more than o it is more than Oko. Oko's yet to have a... Well, it depends how long it lasts. If we get to ride this one out, I think Oko's going to overtake him. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But there was a time, and then it was banned in Modern, so we never got to know, right? Because it also For just time, crushed yeah. Extended. That's the other problem. Jace might have been more dominant still. At least in Standard, definitely was. Because there was a time where people were like, if you don't have four Jace in your deck, you can't top eight. Like, it was that bad. Mm -hmm. Whereas we're not there yet in Standard. We're like one or two decks off the top eight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, but it's not full. Like, it's not a full thirty-two. So, mm -hmm. it's just not the same yet. All right, I'll go get second. 
But no, I still think Oko is because like the impact on older formats is like still better because it won modern, right? Like the blue yeah. green Urza deck. Yeah. Right. It was Oko. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, Legacy, it's everywhere and Rug Delver and like various other like people playing around with it. One vintage. Yep. It's only trending upwards. <laughs> yeah. It's I mean, not- I guess it's in its name, right? Like, did we not expect it to steal the crown of every format? Yeah. It had to. You're right. You're right. It's king everywhere. <laughs> I don't know though. Like I don't really hate it that much in standard. I don't. I don't know. Maybe I'm on the fence. It just doesn't bug me getting out that much. Yeah, I don't like. It doesn't bug me either. And I'm always been firmly in the camp that I just rather never see bands oh, yeah. in standard. Me too. So I would much rather just ride it out than have another card get banned. Yeah, apparently we're in the small minority here. I think in this. Yeah, one. but I agree. Yeah. But, but I don't think that's the world we live in anymore, unfortunately, man. No. Lord knows I wish it was. <laughs> well, I don't know. Like, I, it's so the Mythic Championship six this weekend, right? It's if, if this is top eight, all Oko, then I think we can firmly say, like, all right, it's a, that's it. Like, it's the best. Yeah. And, and also, it's probably getting banned. Yeah. I mean, there is another ban announcement after the Mythic Championship. Yeah. They're just waiting to see how bad it looks. And I got a feeling it's going to look bad. I, uh, I think I agree with you. But I think pros are also more likely to play rogue than a lot of. I used to think that, but I don't think that's true anymore. About like uh, right now or. Yeah. I don't know, though. I feel like, yeah, maybe, I don't know. I just feel like some teams are going to be like, oh, we got a deck that can break Oko. Even if it's not true, they'll believe into their own hype and show up with non-Oko decks. Well, we're, They'll probably just lose, though. So We're much more likely to see the diverse fields and people going rogue when the the uh, uh, Pro Tour was soon after the release of the set. And now that we're so far in and things have been figured out so much and with Arena and Twitter and everything, just... People, I feel like people just aren't putting the same amount of work into trying to find the new busted thing. They just go with what we know is already really good. I don't know. Like I, I think they're trying though too. Like I saw that Raptor wrote that he tried. He's been trying for the past three weeks to come like to come up with decks that could beat Oko, and he's like, none of them have a positive win rate. So I just gave up. Mm-hmm. You know, it's bad when like Josh Utterlayton's saying this. You know, that guy's like famously. You know, Hall of Famer, and one of the reasons for him being in the Hall of Fame wasn't just that he was good, but that he was like a renowned deck builder, right? Am I mistaken on this? No, I think you're right on that one. I'm quite sure about this one. And you know it's bad when a renowned Hall of Fame deck builder for these creative brews and deck tuning and all these things he would do over the years is saying, "I, I can't beat this card. Like, there's just nothing we can do. All right, so if Raptor's given up, who else do we have that could... Who else can we have hope in? Has Sam Black given up? Uh, Lee C10. <laughs> Always have hope in your boy, yeah, LST. Right. LST. Yeah. Ken Yukihiro. Ken Yukihiro, dude. That guy, that guy. Oh, yeah. The God, man. That guy <laughs> don't play. Yeah, Ken, for sure. Yeah. Our predictions aren't what's going to win because it's just going to be eight Oko decks or the people we're naming right now get into top <laughs> yeah. eight with something else. <laughs> so our predictions are that. Yeah. Uh, what's his face? Uh, was it Dominguez? He'll play some. He'll play something weird too. Yeah, he Maybe cool he, last time. he definitely plays weird stuff. Well, like he he will either show up with like the tier zero net deck or like some random thing. Like he never goes in between. Like he never takes the like tier one deck. You know, he always mm. plays either tier zero or some brew. Okay, is this how is this not the obvious brew, right? So like Javier did well with Gruel and Brickleaf, and Oko is really good. And Stella, you've been playing some Teamer Walkers. Yeah. Why are we not just like plussing Sarkon and putting Embercleave on Oko? <laughs> That's just the next level. Yeah, Wait, this sounds nice. <laughs> uh, I have not considered that. Well, go, go home and play it right away, don't worry. <laughs> Embercleave on Oko? We got it. Dude, Embercleave is like, whew, that card is wild. Why aren't we just playing an Oko Spark double deck so we can have multiple Okos at the same time? Ooh. Because one is really good, but what if we had two? Because then you just me? make a 3-3 three, three every turn? Yeah. yeah, make a yeah. food, make an elk. Yeah, if one is so unbeatable, what if? Why aren't we just playing two? Mm, that, that makes sense. Point. Good point. Yeah, watching checks out here. This yeah. might be. <laughs> this is the next level. That is the arms race. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, like I was joking, right? The world, the year is twenty twenty two. The only cards legal left <laughs> in all of Magic are basic lands and elk. Yeah. 
<laughs> Actually, we're making the joke that like with the way the banning seem to be shaping up, uh, particularly in response to the Pioneer bands, which I guess this is a good transition into, that yeah. they just seem so unwilling to ban Oko yet. But yeah, they'll ban every <laughs> other card first. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. It feels really bad to ban a card from the most recent set, right? So I feel like they'll do everything in their power to avoid that happening. <laughs> Vess was uh, Dylan like, ah, wow, I had to read. A, that's the first time in a long time I had to read the text box on a card that was banned because he had no <laughs> idea what Leyland of Abundance did, I think, or maybe his oath. Uh, Patrick Sullivan made a similar tweet too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we'll hop over to Pioneer Bands. We had the first three cards since the fetch lands being banned this Monday in Pioneer, Oath of Nyssa, Leyland of Abundance, and Felidar Guardian getting axed from the format. Immediate thoughts. Well, I knew Cat was going. Yeah, Cat was going to go. Like, yeah, uh, was, yeah. Leyline, I was like, yeah, yeah, reasonable. I think it should be Nykthos too. Yeah. So or or Nykthos. Their reasoning was they think Nykthos can exist and still be a fine yeah. archetype without being too good. The, yeah, this is the pod <laughs> problem. Like, this is just a pod problem thing. Like, you're trying to ban the wrong things to avoid facing the fact that this is just like an unhealthy card, you know? Mm. I get the attempt. Like, yeah, Nykthos is kind of a cool effect. It awards devotion. People love devotion. So you want to leave that payment, uh, payoff in the format for people who want to try and deck build around it. Sure, I get the attempt. What I really hope they do is that if they do eventually decide to ban Nykthos, they like release a statement about like, Leyline was gone because of Nykthos. So, like, Nykthos banned, Leyline unbanned. Like, swap them when they do. They won't do that. They won't, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're, like, taking a pretty new and unique approach to banning and curating this format in the beginning. So, like... Yeah, I like that. So, maybe they will, though. Like, yeah, yeah why not? Yeah, like, yeah. they could just write a statement. Like, yeah, we said we tried to leave Nykthos in and we only banned this because we wanted to leave Nykthos. So, like, there's no reason for it to be banned if we do ban Nykthos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the funniest things to me, though, is their so in their statement, and they also said that Othanissa was banned due to the prevalence of three mana planeswalkers, you know, mm -hmm. and they just don't ban Sahili and they just don't ban Teferi or Oko, you know, it's like, right, okay. So it's, yeah, the complaint is that it's just not addressing the actual issue, which is three mana planeswalkers. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that is interesting because like the Fetchland band, I feel like, the preemptive fetchland ban was along the same vein. Like that is a ban that removes consistency from decks. You're not able to play four colors or five colors or even three as easily without lands that powerful. So like mm -hmm. if you're going after things for consistency, then yeah, like once upon a time is sort of looming near the chopping block. Yeah. I but don't think that's what it is though. They probably won't ever get rid of once upon a time but it is interesting that that's how they're thinking about the format yeah i think that's a mistake though which is like why i'm critical was critical of it like i think oath is not the issue the issue is three mana planeswalkers but also the fetch land band is also definitely so they didn't have to ban start with just banning death right shaman and mm -hmm. then from there having to ban other cards and then you know what i mean it just spirals out of control just banning yeah. fetches is safe because because otherwise you're gonna have to ban death right in this format that's true. Because the minute like fetches are legal in the format, death rights just the best thing you can be doing immediately. That's just how it works. Yeah. Of so that's like yeah, we've we've seen this happen. Yeah, we know this multiple is times happen. already. It's yeah. banned in every other format where yeah. there's fetches. Like we know this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I'm not surprised by this. The I knew the cat cat or Sahili was gone. Like there's just no way that this card was saying. I I think Treasure Cruise is still going to get it, just not yet. Which I also said. I think it'll take a while for Cruise to demonstrate. I have some thoughts on this. I think I, while I agree with the Felidar Guardian ban, I actually don't think it was too powerful for the format. I think, but I think the ban makes sense for just like a quality of life kind of thing yeah. and for diversity, just because it kind of, the gameplay against those style of decks are kind of annoying and people don't really enjoy it. So more, f I agree with it more for that reason, but I actually don't think Felidar Guardian was too good for the format with the power level of all the other decks in the format yeah, as they currently exist. I'm only torn because of things like Veil of Summer and the, the removal is already so bad that like that deck just has too many like consistent ways to do the same thing. Yeah, but I mean like some of the best cards against it are red. So like, like Is It Phoenix was one of the worst matchups for Felidar Guardian yeah. and uh, they just killed your stuff with red cards. Yeah. So like I, I see what you're saying, but... 
Yeah, I just don't think there's like tons of great answers to it for now, which is also part of it. Like I get banning it. I knew it was getting Yeah, I like I I agree. I'm not saying I don't think it should have been banned. Like I think it should have been banned, but I just don't actually think the deck as a you know deck was actually too good for the format. Yeah, the yeah. format could but have adapted make, to it. It, it makes sense not, for other yeah. reasons. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Um, Speaking of, is it Phoenix? Uh Played against it a couple times tonight. Actually, Stelly and I went and played Magic. Where did we go Pioneer. play? We went to Wizards Tower. Oh, the owners of WizardTower.com, the great sponsor of this podcast. Yeah. They had my single needs. <laughs> we went out for Tuesday <laughs> night Pioneer. <laughs> Check them out, WizardTower.com. Yeah, they got Pioneer on Tuesdays now and yeah. one Sunday a month as well. Yeah. So you can try out all your new brews, um, try and get some cards banned. Mm-hmm. But yeah, played against Phoenix twice and there was quite a lot of Phoenix in the room. It does not feel good when your opponent's third spell is a treasure cruise. Yeah. Leaving Phoenixes in the yard. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, they brought back Phoenixes. And I'm used to playing against it in standard where it's like, okay, they brought back Phoenixes. They're out of gas. I just need to deal with this. Then they untap and they have five cards. And I'm like, uh, hmm. (laughs) Yeah, I can never stop these again. Yeah. And there's only like deck and stone in the format to like deal with them. Yeah. Well, I mean, okay, so it felt bad. I didn't lose. I went 4-0. Mm. Um, I played against it in round four too and I was in a decent position in game one my opponent had no cards in hand and they top tech to treasure, treasure cruise and just like won immediately <laughs> which, felt, <laughs> which felt pretty bad but I won the next two games with scavenging ooze that card beast yeah, scavenging ooze yeah. is a monster in pioneer I'm mm-hmm. just like watching tons of streams of pioneer while I'm doing others like playing standard basically Yeah, man scavenging ooze but that's also a creature that I'm quite high on like even in modern i made the argument for years that it was top three modern creatures yeah it felt very very good tonight i played i played hardened scales yeah uh black green hardened scales that Um, deck's also nuts it yeah the deck feels really good my one loss was to abj who was playing the blue red shrapnel blast scissors deck yeah and i lost to a turn two scissors both games yeah see that's just lucky i think that deck's actually bad well you, I can't really kill an indestructible 5-5, five five, mm-hmm. and I can't really kill a Hazoret either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the addition, that, those, those were problems. So I was playing against <laughs> it a bit, and it was fine. But mm-hmm. since he added Hazoret, like, it's not a card that a lot of people sort of have on their radar when they're deck building, and so a lot of people just don't have answers for Hazoret in their 75 currently. Yeah, you just die to it. Yeah, yeah like game one, the ground but it could was be anything. Up. Like, yeah. it, any deck can just play Hazoret, because Hazoret's just insane. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I played Dredge. Dredge Emerge. Dredge. Uh, yeah, Dredge. Dr. Octopus, something like this. Um, Emerge. Because <laughs> <laughs> this was a, sort of an archetype that we thought might come back into Pioneer, and Steli had came up with a preliminary list. And I was looking around on Goldfish, and there was a bunch of lists there. And I just sort of amalgamated, prized amalgamated the two. Because <laughs> I wanted Jace, which was nuts, better than Scrap Heap Scrounger. Mm-hmm. JVP. Yeah. It just flips like immediately because you're grudging. Yeah, that guy's nuts. Uh, and I wanted Elder Deep Fiends, which other lists weren't playing. Elder Deep Fiend, the only reason I could beat Phoenix. They like bring back two Phoenixes, like hit you for six or nine or whatever. And then I'm like, all right, I'm just going to never let your creatures be untapped again and kill you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I know. Deck was a ton of fun. Fit creeping chills in, like just high rolling people, bringing back zombies. Yeah, you should put your deck up in the uh, Discord. Yeah, I will. For people to see deck looked really good and happy with my sideboard so i was trying to play cause x returns main because that's sort of what it was doing in standard and then realized that it's kind of too slow and reactive and i wanted something more high rolly and proactive so i cut those to fit creeping chills in the main but i didn't cut them entirely i put them in the sideboard <laughs> then i played against master of waves which i got to cause x return in game two and three <laughs> and it was my only way to answer that card <laughs> nice. yeah that's pretty good Wait, so you want it to be proactive instead of reactive? Wow, how'd you get so smart? Was it from listening to last week's well, episode? Well, did chirp me because I, I did. came I over and I had an unmoored ego in my graveyard and he's like, what, what's that doing in there? I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I, I can chump a thing in the ice. I just need to get rid of these phoenixes. <laughs> so actually, I told Cam, when Cam played Esper Dragons on Sunday. That was the other deck I've been playing in, or in, played once in, in Pioneer. Pioneer. I actually yelled at him. I was like, you have to put it on. I hate, I hate to say this. I'm so sorry. But you actually have to put an unmoored ego in your sideboard, possibly two. 
What did I what did I say it was for? Again? Just because Nexus is around. Right. Because Control Nexus decks cannot beat a Nexus yeah, yeah. without Unmarred Ego. That's Be- like the acceptable case. That's the only acceptable case because like you just can't win otherwise. It's the only answer you can have for the Nexus deck, which won the PTQ that night. Yeah. And I was telling Cam, like, no, dig through time, Nexus Reclamation is like insane. It's gonna be one of the best co- decks in the format. Like, you need Unmarred Ego. And then like he came home later that day and he's like, Hey, like won a game against like someone because I just unmarred ego. <laughs> and they yeah. just said no so other Benson. options. Benson, for good friend of the show, social media manager, champion of the latest organizational, yeah, did show up on the Sunday event with Nexus, got o would by Burn and left. <laughs> so like he saved me. The Burn you did get somebody me. with it. I can't. Yeah, remember. I played against Cat Combo and I named oh. his cats. And he just realized he had no other way. To and win. he had no creature lands, had no other win cons, except Sahili. Was, really? So was trying to ping me out. Wasn't even playing like one ones like mana dorks or. No, Oko's, it was, no, it's just guy control, like oh. Sphinx's Rev, oh. Cat Combo. I guess he could have ultimated Architect of Thought and took one of my dragons. Mm. Yeah, that would have worked. But I didn't let that happen. <laughs> I spy classed it. Man, I forgot <laughs> Architect of Thought is legal. That card's crazy. I found mine in my collection the other day. It's no JVP, though. No. JVP is like absurd in this format. Yeah. Format is a hype. It, it's really fun. I've been having it's a been blast great. playing it. It's so much better than modern, which. I made my way out to the face-to-face open here in Ottawa <laughs> you got some on stories? Saturday to play some modern. And let me tell you, highlight of my week, my day was losing on turn two to a kiln feed and a tainted strike. <laughs> it was awesome. Are you playing Tron? Yeah, of course. <laughs> so, my tournament. I'm right here. <laughs> so get this. Round one, I get paired against Mono Red Pow- Prowess. I lose a die roll. And I win game one, believe it or not. My That's mom. insane. Things are looking pretty good. Maybe uh, maybe it's going to be a good day for me. Lose game two and, get, <laughs> and turn three, obviously. Game three on the play, mull to six, mull to five, mull to four, mull to three. See my first hand with more than two lands in it, but they're both forests. I'm like, well, I can never beat Prowess on a mull to two, and he snap kept seven, so I'm dead. So I'm like, we'll just play two lands and die, and I died on turn three. I'm like, okay, sweet. Round two, paired against Burn, lose a die roll. Like, win game one on the draw. I'm like, sweet, all right. Lose game two on turn three. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is this feels a little familiar. And I look at my opening seven for game three, and I'm like, mull. Six, <laughs> mull. Five, mull. I'm like, you have to be kidding me, man. Four, unplayable, mull. I'm like, god damn it. Look at my look at my neck, my uh, three card. Put back everything except a power plant, a mine, and a worm coil, and I won. Oh, jeez. My opponent kept a hand with no one drops, and I won. So oh my. I was in it. And I lasted one more round before I got turn two, taint, and strike both games. What a fun format. Yeah, it was awesome. Th- your games sound thrilling. The, yeah, I, was, I had a great time. Not really. People kind of know, I think, that we have a bias like where we kind of junk on mod. There are times, I will admit, we'll modern type. And modern seems in a healthy place. Mm-hmm. I will say it when I think that's the case. It ain't the case right now. The the best part though about the round I lost on turn two to Tainted Strike and Kiln Fiend was that there was a match playing beside me between Neoform and Eldrazi Tron, and the Eldrazi Tron player had never seen Neoform before. So he just like <laughs> dies with one land in play in, in game one on turn two, and he's like, This is turn two. This is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy's like, the other guy's like, yeah, it's like, you know, 60% to go off and like blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Just like game two. I watched the whole thing because my match ended immediately. <laughs> In game two, the Neoform player had a turn one kill but messed it up and like forgot to reveal a cha- uh, a chancellor. Oh, so he like yeah. didn't have the extra mana and just like lost <laughs> because of it. Oh, no. And then in game three, he tried to go for a turn three kill and his opponent had a warping wheel, which won the game because he couldn't pay for the pact yeah. afterwards. So it was Yikes. It was just like peak modern followed by peak modern modern <laughs> side by side. It was awesome. What was the other thing I saw recently that uh, someone called peak modern? There was a five color burn list won some event. Well, oh, that is peak modern. That's uh, hype. Oh, are you uh, talking about the Moto Challenge? There was, um, yeah, maybe it was like mostly like red, white, burn, but it had like green sideboard cards and one Delver of Secrets main and like, yeah, this, this list thing. just burn four twenty <laughs> <laughs> seven one in the modern. What challenge. is this deck, dude? <laughs> one Delver of Secrets, four Goblin Guide, four Swift Spear. Yeah, 
Bump, bump in the night. Bump in the night's bolt. legit. Tarkus Command, Boros Charm, Blaze, Rift Bolt, Skewer. Look at this deck. Dude, the, let's see the side. Oko and the side. <laughs> <laughs> wow. This right. deck's a work of art. He, just burn just burn 420. The guy just hard love trolling, to see it. right? Like that's amazing. What do you mean? This is, this is a legitimate deck. One Delver. You can do whatever you want. You got four gems. I guess on he mine. just now wanted nine one drop creatures. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no other good one mana red options. He had to go for a Delver secret. I also <laughs> just love that he doesn't have a lot of like, well, I guess he's playing mana confluence too. He does have just a lot of City of Brass, Mana Confluence. Yeah, he's going the whole nine. Mind. Oh. I guess he's always going to have a blue source on one. All right, I'm sold. This deck is a work of art. The thing is a masterpiece, man. It just goes to show that you can't rely on the scoreboard. <laughs> you can just win with a ham sandwich, man. It don't matter. That's or actually, what I shouldn't you go calling that far. this a ham sandwich. I shouldn't go that far. What I was getting at is I made this point a long time ago, and we've made it a bunch over the course of this show's history that I think that being neurotic about like a single card choice doesn't matter. Do you know what I mean? Like you should be thinking about what your decks, maybe this is a topic for a different day of thinking about this, that mm. you should be thinking about what your deck's strategy is, not the card choice, right? And like then what cards fit with that strategy choice? Mm -hmm. Because like, look at this, this deck should never win a tournament or do well, but I mean, it has a one of Delver and it, you know, some won the modern challenge. Like it just goes to show that like worrying about card choices don't matter. You just <laughs> got to have a game plan, dude. Just smash. If you if you register like ninety percent a cohesive plan, you're good to go. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. You can have a few stinkers in there. Everybody makes mistakes. <laughs> that was also kind of something I found uh, sideboarding with the dredge deck in Pioneer is that there's like it didn't feel like there was a lot of room because like everything is kind of an enabler or a payoff. And so when I was sideboarding, I found that I was trimming like one Jace, one Salvage, one this, one that. Just to like make room for some cards because I like didn't really want to cut too many of anything. Well, yeah, I mean the interesting thing about your deck is that it just has so many enablers that like right, but like you don't need to be as all in and post yeah, sideboard games, right? But so. like the ninety percent thing, like I never cut an entirely cut an effect because no cards ever really bad in a matchup. Mm -hmm. I just like trimmed one from each, submitted ninety percent of a cohesive game plan with some flex slots. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> start your flexing. Yeah. <laughs> So where are we going in Pioneer now with these bands? The graveyard. Oh. Um. <laughs> <laughs> what do we think's best moving forward? Uh, I mean, I think like Treasure Cruise dig decks. Yeah, uh, but I think so. the metagame is not going to be dominated. I don't think there's a tier zero deck, and that's a good thing yet. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll see what happens. But I think like the key players in the archetypes like remain, you know, like Teferi 3, uh, treasure cruise, dig through time, like these sort of whatever, and then wherever they fit, like we'll see Phoenix decks do well. I think mid range decks can do well. I wouldn't be surprised if we see an increase as the power level levels out a bit towards moving towards Emrakul, the promised end decks. Mm -hmm. You know, trying to just turbo Emrakul, uh, quote unquote turbo, just buy some play mid range decks with Emrakul. Like Thought sees you, like Thought sees is absurd. Yeah, well, Car I mean, after these bands, the two, I guess two of the fastest decks in the formats are gone. So yeah. the format's going to slow down a lot and probably yeah. become a lot more interactive. So these Thoughtseize decks are prone to do better now, yeah, I would say. But that also just makes Treasure Cruise and Dig also like yeah. Yeah, pretty <laughs> yeah. good. But yeah, no, I mean, I, I just think Emrakul's like an absurd, absolutely absurd card. Yeah, that's like what, something that's on my watch list for being banned actually in this format is Emrakul, The Promised End. I, I, I could 100% see a, a case where we end up having to ban that card. That's what our friend Pete played on Sunday. He came to play Pioneer with us. Mm -hmm. uh, big fan of green black decks. That guy just loves rocking out. And yeah, like Traverse Delirium green black with Emra Cools. And he was just like traversing for Den Protector, flipping it, getting back Traverse, traversing for Den Protector, flipping it, getting back Traverse, playing yeah. Tireless Trackers, just super grindy green creatures. Tracker in this format is not so. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'd be interested in collected companying some trackers into play. I haven't seen any collective company decks around. Yeah, that's there's, paper. Yeah, in paper you don't yeah. see them, but they're, in online they're, on they're, they're all yeah, over. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, people are trying it out. So, but I think all these things are viable. Like, there's so much fun stuff you can play with. But yeah, I'd just be looking to play Treasure Cruise and Dig Through Time that they didn't get axed. So, mm -hmm. I mean, Phoenix just seems like such a fun choice because you get to cast Treasure Cruise. Like, you don't get to play Treasure Cruise anymore anywhere unless you play Vintage. Like, 
Yeah, I am stoked that we get. That's like an honor to be able to cast that card again. Whatever narrow window to cast <laughs> yeah. it, yeah, because it feels great. It is busto. <laughs> card is so good, and yeah. it just yeah, like Cam said. The feeling on that thing is... Uh, yeah, I won a game because I didn't quite have enablers, but I cast a treasure cruise, ended up with eight cards in hand. I got to discard a haunted dead to hand size. <laughs> and then we're off to the race. Yeah, and then use it to pitch some amalgams, and here we go. <laughs> hey, whoa. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'll just be playing those cards. Like, whatever my deck is, I'm going to have cards I think that should be banned in it. So yeah, that's how I'd approach this. Plus, like, Jace Finn's Prodigy is just a super fun card. You know, I never hated it in standard, but people are mad about it all the time. Like, you know what I mean? Because I don't think it was ever as bad as like Oko or something. The card was no. fine. Yeah, it was fine. JVP was awesome. It would give you yeah. an advantage, but not an advantage every turn. You could interact with how it flipped or before it flipped. Honestly, yeah. the flip planeswalkers were the best planeswalker designs ever. Changed my mind. Hard agree. I can't yeah, change not, your mind. I'm I don't even think to. it's. I don't even think it's close. Yeah, I think they're the fairest. And most legitimate way to have Planeswalkers exist. It was awesome. Yeah. Nissa 3 is one of my... Actually, it might be my favorite Planeswalker of all time. The Nissa creature that yeah. is just Borderland Ranger. It just gets a land. And yeah, you, I remember she gets a forest. I don't remember what her flip does. Flip like draws cards or makes Ooh. stuff, yeah. Yeah, it makes elementals. Oh, like makes lands. Yeah. A Shia of the Woken World or whatever. Yeah. The 4-4. Oh, yeah, yeah, it makes The legendary token. token. Yeah. yeah, a Shia of the yeah. Woken, Woken World or whatever. And then it's plus it's just draw cards card's amazing it's basically yeah. a blue creature but it ramped i don't know i love that card yeah I, I really like the designs for those jace was super fun to play with skill testing card you know like inherently skill testing in its design what uh, what were the other ones uh, oh Lily kythian was like great and standard yeah yeah kythian, liliana and chandra liliana and chandra what well, chandra was by far the worst one i don't even remember what the flip chandra did she like Untapped when you cast red spells and you had to like ping people three times to flip her. Oh, that's yeah. what it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And then the Liliana like flipped when something you control died or something like this. Yeah. I can't remember what her flip side did though. Yeah, I have no idea. They but. should explore that design space more and save us from the horror that is the recent planeswalker designs. It's so much more flavorful too, right? Like they talk about like these planes, like a planeswalker is someone who's spark ignited. And like I get that Origins was the story of this, but like why don't I, all planeswalkers you cast have to be worked for? All right. Flipped when another non-token creature you control died. Had three loyalty on its back, plus two each player discards a card, minus X, return target, non-legendary creature card with converted mana cost X or less from your graveyard to the battlefield, and minus eight, you get an emblem with whenever a creature dies, return it to the battlefield under your control at the beginning of the next end step. There, this, so this card actually did see play here and yeah. there. It, it actually did. It was the Chandra that never really did. Mm -hmm. It saw some, like this was super the fringe rally, play. right? Because you could yep. flip it. Yeah, there was a bunch of decks that actually like would board into or have a Lily or two main. Yeah, no, Liliana was still good. Like, yeah, I definitely remember Rally playing it. Yeah, there was yeah. a few other people who just played it for value, like as a you know, uh, lifelink threat against aggro decks. Like I saw it on the board of some like mid range decks. Mm -hmm. I saw it on the board of some Jeskai blacklists. You know, like just trying to get value. Like lots of people played it for weird reasons. Yeah. But that. Yeah, like Nissa, Jace, like they were so well designed. And like Cam said, they're flavorful. The fact that they die to a shock, you know, in mo like half of them, it's like, that's good. Mm -hmm. You know, they should be lightning rods for removal spells. Yeah. Even like tonight, I had this like fun interact, like it added interaction to the game in a way that Planeswalkers normally don't. Like, so I had a Jace, my opponent tapped up for like a thing in the ice or something. Um, then I Grizzly salvaged, but I my opponent had one mana up. And I didn't immediately activate Jace. And there was sort of this dance for a couple turns where, like, I knew if I looted first, it would get wild slashed. But they knew that if they wild slashed it first, I would flip it off a loot. And so, like, neither of us were really doing anything, just, like, sizing each other up. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. Because I, I think we were playing a game, right, where I flipped it, or I was against Pete, actually, where I flipped that Jace. And he's like, oh, yeah, right. You know, he, like, remembered how Jace worked. And, yeah. like, I don't know. There's just it's skill testing. There's just super interesting decisions you make when you're offered looting. But I even think Nissa is just fair and honest card. Like I, you know, it has like a pretty huge requirement. Like seven lands is a lot, but you get a lot out of that card. Yeah. Helps you bridge the gap. They all the all of them were like supposed to be self enabling. You know what I mean? Like it's so well designed. And then we just have this recent <laughs> three mana planeswalkers that are just horrendous. Yeah, we're just kind of stuck with them now, though. Yeah. What are you gonna do? Yeah. But I miss those old ones. You're I right. Mean, why are we stuck with them? Please no more. <laughs> yeah, that's all I'm saying. Just reprint the Origins ones. They're so cool. They should do that for every new Planeswalker at the very least, right? 
have a flip uh, version of Every it. Every time there's a new one, you have a flip version. That'd be mm. cool. But they won't because of printing costs, right? It's like then you have to have flip cards. Yeah, which they do rarely, which they hate doing. But Oko would have been so much cooler if it was like some sort of weird creature and, I don't know, some flavorful condition that resembles stealing a crown. And then he turns into a walker. Yeah, you have to own an, a permanent from another player. Yeah, yeah, sure. And he like steals something for some amount or in some condition like takes something. That'd be a hive card. Yeah. Mr. Steely Hands. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take this. And, uh, what is this, a stapler? <laughs> That sounds awesome. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So another really big announcement that we didn't talk about last week was uh, the announcement for fractional invites. They released how they're going to be working. Did you guys see this? No, I did. So GPs matter again. Right. I saw that, but I didn't read the details is what I should say. So I think X4 gets you 25% of an invite now for a pro tour. So if you string together really four X fours in a season, you get a Pro Tour invite. Huh. Plus, top eighting a, a Grand Prix gets you the normal invite like it would. Plus fifty percent towards another invite. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. So yeah, there's some technicalities on like you have to earn a hundred percent of an invite across two seasons and sort of how things carry over and how it all mm-hmm. works. There's some details to read up on. Um, yeah, it looks like a good format. You basically get yeah two GP seasons to accumulate 100% of an invite, and if so, you get to yeah and go to the Pro Tour. It seems a lot easier to just string multiple invites together now if you're putting any kind of effort into it to like travel to a lot of events, right? I think this change is fantastic. Yeah, sort of the phrase that people used to talk about, about like staying on the train. Mm-hmm. It seems a lot easier to do now because... Again, the sort of technicalities, if you read up on them, you kind of qualify for two Pro Tours if you get 100% in one season. Uh, And the Pro Tours themselves award more percentage of invites so they can continue to qualify you for further seasons. That's awesome. Yeah. Big fan of that. Yeah, that's really cool. Some actual info right on. (laughs) I thought you were going to hit us with the the misery, the, the bad announcement, the negativity announcement first, the Star City Games change. No. Which is next, not this coming weekend. But the weekend after is the Star City Games Invitational. That's not a negativity change. That's a sweet change. Though. I know, but dumping I, standard for the Invitational yeah. in for favor Pioneer. Of Pioneer. No, it's Man, actually. Love but it's just that. talking trash on standard more, which yeah, well, yeah, it's whatever. But yeah, they also made that change I for guess, Pioneer though, which is awesome, dude. I am legit excited, dude, it's, to watch at like an SCG that's Pioneer. It's gonna be so good be for the viewer experience. It's gonna be incredible, dude. It's gonna be awesome, and just you overall. can bet that because so many people are going to be interested in this sort of pioneering tournament, mm-hmm. they're going to get Patrick and Cedric. Well, so it's yeah, going to be like A-plus commentary. Yeah, I mean, they, al- they always do the invitational, so. Well, yeah, that's why yeah. I, I, you're good. it's going to be, uh, it's yeah. I'm, I'm right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, speaking of SCG, sort of in relation to the fractional invite thing, there was also a note, I think, in that announcement about fractional invites that they're looking into awarding them from other premier tournaments such as scg yeah mm-hmm. they used to do that well they uh well for the invitational only there was like a time where it gave a pro tour invite remember that well scgs give pro tour invites now too oh do they still first and second place at scg open uh, gets you an invite to the pro tour which they added this year at, at an open or at the invitation open. open really yeah they added it this year it was a recent change the past, I didn't even know th- that. the past three opens have. I should, I should have tried a little harder yeah. at the last SCG. <laughs> well, it's only it's only been the past three opens. I'm pretty oh, sure. Oh, okay. Have given Pro Tour invites to the top two. So but yeah, if they start awarding fractional invites, like we're not super centralized, like in an area of the United States where there's a lot of GPs around, but between GPs and SCGs up here in Ottawa, we should be able to string together some road trips and maybe run hot. Yeah, honestly, Lord like, knows I've gone X for enough. <laughs> yeah, sucks, man. I, I'm actually like really considering maybe just committing and just going balls out for one for like year. A year. So I'm like an X4. You're like an X4 warrior too, aren't yeah. you? Just like, <laughs> yeah. don't, wanna, don't we just have like a ton of X4 yeah. finishes at GPs? Dude, it's miserable. <laughs> I, I never x 4 I only X5. <laughs> Honestly, though, like it's it just it's really cool that you don't have to just completely... You don't have to spike and run super hot. Yeah. You can actually like do consistently well because mm-hmm. you're still doing well x4 is very good yeah so one of the things i always used to hate was like being in canada where we are it's 
hard for us, like geographically to play all the time. Like we just don't have the opportunity. So you're saying like my one local GP a year, we get two, Montreal and Toronto. Yeah. Those are our two chances. If you don't top eight it, you're not making the PT. It's like, that's, you know, it's tough, right? And it's like, what if I'm doing consistently well? What if for the last like several years I've like done really well at those GPs, but I've like X3 to X4, you yeah. know? So now it's like, there's a payoff for that. Like, yeah, you I still, could like, like X4 it and then be like, you know what? I'm going to, maybe I can X4 like Pittsburgh. I'll make the drive. Yeah. yeah it gives you a reason to yeah. travel. And that's what I mean. Before, Even yeah. if you miss, that's like what they want to, right? It's yeah. a gambler's fallacy. It's perfect. Yeah, and I mean, people have been, GP attendance has been way down. People have just not had a reason to go to them anymore, and now there's actual reasons. Yeah. So I expect to see those numbers go way back up again. Right? Yeah, we'll start grinding again. Yeah. We out here. Same place yeah. we've always been. <laughs> X4 in these GPs. <laughs> All right. Well, that's, we've touched on a lot this week. Anything else you guys want to mention before we wrap things up? No, you should just like make sure that you're a patron so you can check out my sweet discussion in the pre-show about yeah. manufacturing identity and selling <laughs> selling yourself and as a we'll do a little plug. Constructed. If you didn't already know, we started a patron a little while ago. If you want to support the show, you can head on over to patreon.com slash DWC podcast. We have a few different tiers, some sweet benefits for all our listeners. Every tier gets access to the DWC Discord. We have a pre-show for all of our listeners as well who sign up for the Patreon, which is a weekly little recording that we do as we're setting up before each episode. It's a little more raw and uncut, you know? Yeah. yeah. No censorship. You know, this is a yeah. family-friendly show as it currently is. Yeah, all patrons super appreciated. We just wanted to shout out some of the most generous patrons. Yeah, want to give a shout out to some of the patrons who've been sticking with us this whole time. Big shout outs to Tim, Michael, Bronson, Phil, Aaron, James, Daniel. I don't know how to say this name, so I'm going to... Michi Piki. <laughs> <laughs> Liam, Kevin, Jay Thomas, Other Thomas, <laughs> Michael, Sully Panda, John, Trevor, Stefan, David, Benson, Shane, Connor, Jack... Tanner, Danny, Fenton, Blair. Man, we have a lot of patrons. Yeah, we do. Yeah, it's good. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much for your support. Yeah, just continuing down the list. Uh, Train, Carrie, Michael, Logan, Cody, Nish, all you guys. Domingo, Jeremiah. Doom Doom Sheridan. Sheridan. That's a cool name. William, Tony, Sean, Rasmus, Don, Josh, Niven, Niven, Todd, Steven, John, Christopher, Harry, Mike, ABJ, Teresa, James, Bob, and that's it. That yeah. wraps it up. So if, shout out to all of you. If you're one of our patrons that we shouted out again, thank you very much. If you're someone who isn't our patron but has the same name as one of the patrons we shouted out, yeah, I mean, I guess you can Next feel time, thanked. this could be you. Yeah, if you become a patron, you can retroactively enjoy this thanking. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only way it's allowed. <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, otherwise. No, thank you. I'm just, I'm just kidding. We hope you to be, we hope you're all honorable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Love that everybody uh, <laughs> listens. The Discord's really cool. Uh, during the school year, I'm a lot less active than I'd like to be in it. Just grading and everything is miserable for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember it was a lot better when I was a PhD student and I was just. Uh, Grading's never better. Just never had a like, you know, a care in the world, you know. Mm. Yeah. Just being useless, sleep until 5 p.m. every day. Man, life was so good back then. Having to get up at like 8 a.m. So. But yeah, if you want to join the club <laughs> here at the DWC, head on over to patreon.com slash DWC podcast. Thank you all for your support. Man, speaking of the troubles of being a grad student, so I recently ordered two math textbooks online. Yeah. Because for like the past two years, I realized that I've been taking out these two books from the U Ottawa library, forgetting to return them despite being emailed that they're almost due, racking up late fees, returning them, Realizing I still need them like two days later and taking them out again. And I'd just been doing this for like years. So <laughs> I finally like went to the library, paid off my late fees and like ordered copies for myself. Wow. <laughs> it's real adults. Of you. Yeah, the struggle is <laughs> real though. All right. Oh, I have tests tomorrow morning. I don't have to do anything, dude. They have an in-class exam. Hype. Dude, I just three exams is like people say it's boring, but I'm just. You just get to stand there. And you like, can't cheat on my tests. So like I, you just watch students stress and like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So coffee, I'm, get paid. Yeah. I can't <laughs> wait. Actually, I don't have to do anything tomorrow. I'm staying up late. Yeah. No lecture prep. 
Yeah, I was thinking of playing play video games. <laughs> Problem is, it means you got to mark whatever they just wrote. But yeah, yeah. It's, so like, this is the thing. Like, yeah. I think students always think, um, "Oh, uh, oh, you're doing less work." It's like, no, no. This is I, I'm doing less work for this hour. I'm here in exchange for doing thirty extra hours of work later when I grade. Mm -hmm. So it's not good. It actually doesn't sucks. sound like a good trade. -off I would at rather all. lecture. Absolutely. <laughs> so not hype. Never mind. Everything's miserable. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for joining the club this week. Make sure, as always, check out wizardtower.com for all your magic single needs. If you want to support the show, head on over to patreon.com slash DWC podcast. And however you listen to the show, whether it's Podbean, iTunes, Spotify, any podcast app, leave a review, rate the podcast, share with your friends. Everything helps this thing keep growing and bring it to new listeners. Thank you for listening. We'll catch you next week. See you.